Um, so I'm here to talk to you about the open sourcing of infrastructure, which I will explain in a moment. Um, but first, I wanted to ask the audience a couple quick questions. So um, usually when I come to these DevOps days, people are mostly using Linux. Um, but I wanted to ask, um, who here is using Linux in your infrastructure? OK. Um, how about Windows? OK, there's a lot of you. <laughs> um, other things, using some old Solaris or Unix type of thing. All right, a few of those in the audience. Cool. All right. So I'm really into open source. Um, so this is going to be a highly opinionated, very open sourcey talk. Um, but a little bit about my background. Um, I'm currently working as a developer advocate over at Mesosphere. Um, that's the company that employs most of the developers for um, Apache Mesos. And we also have an open source and an enterprise project product called DCOS. Um, but before that, um, I spent about 10 years doing Linux systems administration. Um, most recently, I was working on the OpenStack project infrastructure. And in that role there, I started giving a lot of talks about the fact that the OpenStack infrastructure is fully open source. You can replicate the project infrastructure anywhere. Um, so that was a lot of fun. I started speaking a lot. That's sort of how I got to this developer advocate role. Because I was like, I still want to do engineering work, but I also want to go talk about the work that I'm doing a lot. Um, spent about 15 years um, working in open source communities. Um, I had a web developer job back in 2002, um, sort of where I started my career, and I was one of the only people who was using Linux on the desktop. I still am, I think I'm the only one on my team, even though the open source team was using Linux on the desktop. So, really into open source. Um, I have a website uh, called opensourceinfo.org. Um, we host the code for the website on GitLab. So anyone can make changes to the site, but it's a listing of open source infrastructures that I'll talk about in the last part of my talk here. Um, I've also worked on a couple of books, um, the 8th and 9th edition of the official Ubuntu book, and then in September I had uh, Common OpenStack Deployments come out, um, which is a book about deploying OpenStack values using the open source puppet modules. So I wanted to start out by sort of giving a recent uh, history of infrastructure from a highly opinionated open source view. Um, we're sort of looking at the past 20 years here. So going back to like 1997, I was almost graduated from high school, and then sort of starting to get into Linux, because it's pretty cool stuff. Um, but this is the world that we lived in, you know, 15 years ago, um, 17 years ago. Um, a lot of people were using Windows. Um, you were setting up your web servers and things using Windows, and that was fine. Um, but I kind of wanted to get into something different. So I started playing with Linux. And at the time, it was this super upstart. Like, it was hard to use. Um, I didn't get into it in the days of floppy disks, but I did have to use a CD. Um, and we had, like, movies. Anyone familiar with this, this movie here, Revolution OS? Um, okay, it's really... They mean well, but it's really terrible. It's funny. It's, like, got these old gray beards and, like, really... Uh, intense open source people like interviewed in the 90s. And one of the things I love about this cover, aside from being kind of horrible, um, was that it says, like, hackers, programmers, and rebels unite. At this time, we were all, like, we're rebels and we're uh, bucking the trend and we're using this free operating system that no one else is. Um, there was also all this, like, fun, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt surrounding open source software. And a lot of companies were promoting all of this. Uh, we had uh, companies like Microsoft coming out with their total cost of ownership survey, um, which proved that even though you had to pay licensing fees, Windows was cheaper to run than Linux, because Linux is really hard, and you need really smart people to run it. Um, of course, in the Linux community, we were kind of like, that's silly. Like, if you're running 10,000 Windows servers, like, you can hire some Linux engineers for cheaper than that. So there was all this stuff floating around then. And you had, you know, security experts from proprietary systems saying, the source code's out there, there's no way this can be secure. Anyone can just download it and learn how to hack you. Um, and I like to think we've, we've learned a lot from that. And I liked it in a way. Like, Linux was fun. And one of the first things I did uh, when I installed Linux on my system was, I didn't go with GNOME or KDE. I went with Enlightenment. Because Enlightenment allowed me to have a desktop that was just my desktop background. No menus, no icons, no anything. It was just it was beautiful in a natural state. Um, but I did start adding some widgets to it. 
And one of the widgets didn't do what I wanted. So my boyfriend's at the time is like, this is open source. You can just edit the code and recompile it, and then it'll do what you want. I was like, wow, that sounds pretty cool. So I learned as little C++ as possible in order to accomplish my mission, and I patched the software, and I recompiled it, and then I did the thing I wanted. And not only having the power to transform my desktop, like backgrounds and look-wise, but actually changing the way that the um, program uh, behaved was really transformational for me. I was super excited and totally hooked. So, um, in about 2006, um, so we had like a dot-com bust, um, and that was kind of when I was getting into things, and I couldn't really find a job. So I started thinking like, worked as an accountant for a while and did some random things. While well, I was going to like users group meetings, it was pretty exciting and fun, but totally a hobby. Um, but in 2006, um, one of the companies that was affiliated with our local Linux users group said, hey, like, do you want to work for me on a contracting basis, like nights and weekends, racking servers, installing Linux? And I'm like, you'll pay me for that? <laughs> so I started contracting with them, um, and then in 2007 I was hired full-time as a junior systems administrator. And that was pretty much the best thing ever, because I loved playing the servers and I loved doing all this stuff, and so that's how I got into it. Um, a couple of years later, after I had the joined the company, you know, we were still swimming in this sea of fear, uncertainty, and doubt around open source. Um, this was in Philadelphia, so it wasn't like, I live in San Francisco now, where everything is new and shiny and amazing, but Philadelphia, not quite up with the times. There was a lot of questions about open source, People were really scared about using Linux. I'm like, well, Google and Amazon use it. Or they're like, yeah, we're an insurance company in Philadelphia. <laughs> um, so the company I was working for doing systems administration, at, we use Debian, always Debian. No Ubuntu, no Red Hat. I guess we had a big customer and they had a Red Hat box and we worked on it. But we were really committed to like pure open source. So we hosted this seminar for customers and potential customers to talk to them about open source. And looking at this list of talks now, it's kind of funny to me how far we've come in the past eight years. Um, so we talked about, we explained what open source software was. And these were like people managing IT and people coming to our conference. There. So there wasn't like, um, they didn't know about technology, we weren't really talking to many CEOs. So first we had to explain what it was. Um, and my favorite one here is using open source web applications to produce business results. Like that's what our world is built on. People use open source software to build web applications all day long. It's a huge thing. But at the time, we had to explain it. Um, and this is, this is one of my slides. My slides have gotten slightly better since then. Um, I think this was like a LibreOffice default slide. So I, I had to explain why you would want the source code. You know, you, so you can customize the software. You more easily develop on top of it. You could fix your own bugs without waiting for vendors, controlling security. Kind of the, the typical things uh, we talk about when we promote open source. And in the years following that presentation, we saw a really huge flood of changes in our industry. Um, websites became a lot more serious. Um, downtime was super unacceptable. Like, I'll see it sometimes on my bank website, but I don't usually see like downtime warnings anymore on websites. It's just not really a thing that people do anymore. Um, we all pretty much keep our systems running all the time, and that's what it is expected from the customer. If I see a website that's down, I'm like, I don't know, they gotta get their stuff together over there, because it's not the normal thing. Um, there's also been an increase in uh, concern over security. Uh, companies want the power to fix their own bugs. Um, there was also an increasing um, desire not to be locked in by a vendor. Um, one of the best stories um, one of my former colleagues tells is he's been in the industry a long time, so this story is from the 80s, and he was saying that he was working with a company, I don't remember if it was an insurance company or a travel agency, it was you know, something that's not a tech company, they say. Um, and they were looking to buy a platform service in um, like 1985, and the company wouldn't give the source code because it wasn't really a thing they did. And they said, well, what if you guys go out of business? Or what if you're bought by someone else or something happens and now I don't have support for this software that I just built my entire business on? And they're like, that won't happen. I'm like, all right, well, if it does, will you give us the source code when you go out of business? And they're like, sure. Like, you pay extra for that, we'll put it in the contract, that's fine. 
So they did, and you know where this is going, right? They went out of business. Um, so then suddenly, this company that's not a tech company has the source code for this software. And it turns out tons of their competitors were using it as well. So pretty much overnight, they turned into a software company. They realized they had the source code, they had the ability to support it, they hired a bunch of technologists, and they ended up supporting the other companies around them. And that was a really extraordinary story, I thought, from like, they, they made their way out of not being locked into a vendor um, by making this arrangement. And that showed really interesting foresight that a lot of companies, their competitors, didn't have. Um, we've also seen this increase, especially in you know, the DevOps world of like scaling and automation. Um, that became a really big deal. And it turns out that's kind of hard to do in Windows, although it's getting a lot better. Um, and then we have this transition from you know pets to cattle when you're talking about servers. Like, you know, we have that server in our data center that takes five minutes to boot up, and sometimes the RAM's a little funny on it, or the Ethernet card, like that don't use that port, it's a little funny. Um, we don't have that quite as much anymore. Um, the servers are more interchangeable. Uh, we're moving off to you know, uh, sort of elastic cloud services. Um, so we don't have quite as many pets. There's a larger focus on data. Data is a really big deal these days, and we have a lot more of it. So I sort of see all of these changes, and then this lab stack as like sort of a big turning point in the use of open source software because it made it so much easier. Uh, lab stack, Linux, um, Apache, MySQL, and then PHP, Perl, Python, whatever. Um, it sort of made it all very easy. Um, all of these components are super stable. Like at the time, the people started adopting them really strongly. Like Linux was getting easier to use. Apache and MySQL are pretty much turnkey. Like they work just out of the box. Um, and then the programming languages associated with that were, were relatively easy um, to program with. So we saw this explosion of people switching to Linux and launching these Linux stacks. Also, I took this picture and I was like, get off the little I have to take a picture. So we're sort of living in a world now where open source is ubiquitous. You no longer need to explain what it is to people. Um, you don't really need to explain the security benefits of what it brings to you. Um, and I, I was at this conference um, for um, Elasticsearch a couple years ago, and they left these USB sticks on our chairs. I didn't end up using it. I just flashed it and gave it away to my friend and thought it was funny. But during one of their keynotes, they told us that in part of their infrastructure at Microsoft, they're using Ubuntu. I was like, wow, <laughs> Microsoft's using Ubuntu, that's, that's quite a change. So it's, it's pretty much everywhere these days. And one of the things I noticed, especially as someone working in operations, is that suddenly developers were getting really familiar with using, developing on, contributing to, and sharing open source software. And that was super exciting, and that's awesome. As an operator, we were using and developing on open source software. We weren't really contributing too much. We weren't really sharing much. And that led to a really sad state of affairs where when I left my last operations job, I left all of my tools behind. And I was like, oh man, that rsync script is really awesome, but I never open sourced it. It never even occurred to me to do so. So now I have to write it again. <laughs> and that was, that was not a lot of fun. Um, so we sort of started seeing this trend of operators open sourcing their stuff as well. That was exciting for me because I love open source. And we've sort of done that as a community. Um, it, I, I'd say that like configuration management led the way here. Um, you started seeing puppet modules, chef cookbooks, and Ansible playbooks. These would all come out to configure the really basic things. So like I never have to configure Apache again because there's a puppet module. I just need to change a few variables in puppet and now uh, Apache is running, and I didn't need to write any config files, and that was really great. Um, because we're all configuring things pretty much the same way with a few changes. And there's no reason for us to all go through the pain of doing the same configurations over and over again between jobs and like between us. Um, you then started seeing like open application def definitions that are multi-server. So um, I work at DCOS, we have this universe catalog. It can install things like Kafka, Cassandra, across multiple nodes. It's, so the, the deployment mechanism is node aware, it knows how many nodes it needs, it knows there's a master, it knows how they need to communicate, and then it 
automatic to place these things. And the same thing with Juju Charms. These are the ones that Canonical developed for Ubuntu, and they do a similar sort of um, multi-node deployment. Um, so we're seeing more of this um, coming out. And of course, these are all open source as well. Like you can write your own universe packages, you can write your own Juju Charms, um, and the collaboration on these is pretty open. And now, if you're using containers, we're even sharing like whole disk images with each other. Docker Hub is huge, and people are putting all kinds of stuff up there. And I don't necessarily trust it, but lots of people do. <laughs> and then they just pull down like shared um, um, disk images that do very basic things that they don't want to redo by themselves. Um, so we've seen this real transformation in the operation space of sharing our tools and open sourcing all of it. So that's sort of where we are now. Um, and I wanted to bring us into sort of this next phase I see of open sourcing of infrastructure. This is where I'm going to upset the sponsors because I have some unpopular opinions about where we're going next. <laughs> um, but I want to take us back for a minute to think about what the reasons we have um, are for going open source, open source in the first place. Um, one of them is security. We want to be able to see the source code. We want to be able to do an analysis of that source code and make sure it's good. Um, we also wanted to not have to wait for a vendor if there's a security vulnerability. Um, I remember I was using um, one of the customers we had when I was living in Philadelphia was a shipyard. And one of the things we had to do was we were running a Red Hat box there, and it was this database server that, like, it, it, its job was holding all the data for this giant machine that would cut big metal to make ships. And I'm like, wow, that seems pretty important. So the database was no longer supported. It had this massive security vulnerability. And the best we could do was just firewall it off of everything. Like the box didn't really have internet access. Um, and that was really disappointing because I was like, you guys have bet your company on this unsupported software. It has no security support. Um, and you don't want things to mess up when you're cutting chips. Um, so security is a big thing. Um, and this ability to diagnose and fix bugs without vendor intervention. Um, you want the vendors to be able to, if you're using a vendor, you want them to be responsive, but often times, if you're a smaller customer, they're not going to be very responsive. So we want an open source so we can fix our own stuff. And if you're in a really tight spot, you can just hire a contractor to build what you want to build. Um, and then you want an increased control over your data and services. Again, like all that ship cutting stuff in that database, you don't know what that database is doing. You probably want to know that. So we switched to open source software to gain a lot of this stuff. Um, and avoiding vendor lock-in. Software gets really expensive over time. Um, and then when you build your whole business on the platform, um, you kind of get yourself stuck. And I was looking over this list. And of course, this wasn't, these aren't the only reasons we want open source. But it occurred to me that we're getting ourselves into all these traps again. So think about the cloud. I'm including infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. And to sort of compare it back to this list. Like, where are we falling foul with this list when we're blocking ourselves back into all of these um, services? So I, mentioned, I think I mentioned I used to work on OpenStack. And there was an OpenStack summit about a week and a half ago. And I was so glad because this was a great quote from Edward Snowden at the OpenStack summit. Um, and I'll just read it here. He said, most people just consume the cloud without thinking. Many users are seeking constant infrastructure that's not theirs. They're giving up data and inf information about themselves without thinking. And part of the gist of his talk was talking about um, you know, the cloud and, and other information services from a security perspective. Um, and I think one of the big targets of this talk was Amazon. And the fact that so many companies are investing in putting their entire infrastructure in one company. And we saw sort of a symptom of this um, a couple months ago when Amazon had an S3 outage in their um, East Coast region. Um, I believe the East Coast region is the first place where they had S3. So everyone put their stuff there. Um, it was kind of the default region. Um, so a lot of companies didn't do a very good job of splitting up where their region, where their data was put. And I remember that morning, 
Like, half the internet was unusable. Like, no joke. It was a really bad morning. Even for our company, which like prides ourselves on being agnostic, we found places we were using S3. <laughs> um, it was like our Amazon templates that we have for downloading our software. And I think a lot of companies found out that morning that putting everything in one place wasn't necessarily a good idea. And you think of this from like a national security perspective, even a world security perspective. What do we give up by putting all of our data into one company? And it's actually pretty scary. Um, they end up being a huge target, um, and you're going to be vulnerable to anything that happens to that company. So I want to talk about thinking about these problems here. Before we swipe a credit card and put everything in the cloud, um, there are a few things I want you to pause. And think about here. The first thing is that you, you want to ask yourself whether the service that you're going to use is adhering to open standards. Um, I love open source, but I hate managing mail servers. When that was my job, I really was an unhappy person. Fighting spam, getting complaints from customers that something was blocked as spam that wasn't spam, um, always having to throw resources at it because email was just getting out of control and crazy. I hated email. So in 2007, I shut down my personal mail server and switched to Gmail. And so I used like a Google hosted domain for my email now. And I've been doing that for the past 10 years. But one of the things I looked at when I was looking at switching my email from running it myself, where I had control and I knew I could change anything at any moment, was whether the service I was moving to um, adhered to open standards and whether I could leave. Um, in Google's case, um, they use regular mail protocols. Um, I have a script that, that uses offline IMAP to download my mail every day to make sure that I have backups. Um, and if I wanted to switch to a different service, I could just take those backups and move on to another service. So the fact that they had open standards made me consider them. And that was really important to me. So when you're evaluating um, these cloud-based tools, whether it's an API that you're building against or a cloud service that you're using, um, you want to consider whether they're using open standards or are you just building to their platform um, and then getting yourself locked in, just like we did with proprietary software, which this essentially is. Um, you also want to know what your recourse is, um, if the vendor goes out of business or is bought by a competitor. Um, one of my favorite stories of this is uh, uh, a colleague was building their platform on a piece of software, you know, like a software as a service, and they really loved it because it was done by the startup and it was fucking the trend of everything that the you know, giant proprietary company was doing. And they were like, this is awesome, they're doing all the right things, and I hate that proprietary vendor, that big one's awful, this startup's really great. Um, and then the startup went out of business. No, they almost went out of business, but they were bought by the competitor. The competitor shut them down. They were like, we're not going to run the service anymore, so suddenly my friend was stuck with the old software that he hated and didn't want to use. Um, and that was really unpleasant because he had already built his whole infrastructure against this other product that had gone away and was shut down. Um, so you want to consider, before you invest in a platform, what you're going to do if they go away. Even if they tell you they're fine and they're not going to go away, you want to have an exit plan sort of baked into your um, deployment plans. I mean, you could just get another job when this happens. <laughs> um, it's best to sort of plan for this. Um, you also want to make sure that the vendor has uh, a history of communicating clearly with their customers and their community um, about things like downtime, um, security vulnerabilities, um, and, and other things that are similar to this. Um, it helps if they have a dashboard, um, if they're going public or at least to their customer postmortems to explain what happened, um, because these things will help you be more reassured about the fact that they are conscious about security and wanting to communicate with their customers when there's downtime. Um, because a healthy, healthy operations team is going to want to share that information and prove to their customers that this won't happen again. And just saying this won't happen again is not very reassuring. Um, so being honest about their outages. And I will say that Amazon does a pretty good job of having like a, a downtime dashboard. Unless it's reporting S3 downtime and they use S3 in their dashboard. That totally happened. I'm sure they fixed it. Um, but to their credit, they do a pretty good job of alerting their customers. Um, you also want to see whether this vendor that you're looking at responds to bugs and feature requests. 
Um, you may start off by talking to their sales guy who says, oh yeah, we'll fix all your bugs and do all the things. But if you're on the lower end scale of your support contract, they may not be very responsive to that. Um, you may also want to look at whether the, they have like a free offering. Like a lot of these um, software as a service based tools have like, you know, it's free up to 10 licenses. Um, you want to see how they treat the free customers. Um, are they responding to bug and feature requests from the free customers, the people who are trialing it, um, to the people who are always free customers? Um, you sort of want to look out and see if there is any public communication um, and whether those, those are being addressed. Maybe talk to some of the other customers using them already. Um, a place like this is really great for that because you know we've got all these sponsors, and I'm sure some of you are users of the software already, so you can sort of network with people um, and learn how they're using the software and what problems they ran into, and whether the vendors have been responsive. Um, you also do have some security concerns. Um, you want to make sure that the company is not using your data in a way that you are not comfortable with. Um, this is probably where you have to get some lawyers involved to look at contracts and see what they're allowed to do with your data. But the real problem here is that not only can it be uncomfortable for you, you could actually be breaking arrangements with your customers if you're uploading your data and sharing their statistics in a way with a third party and you're not sure how they're using that data on their end. Um, it may just be that they're doing analysis on it, um, maybe they're not sharing it, um, but they could be doing internal work on it that you told your customer that wouldn't happen. So you want to make sure you understand your own agreement with your customers and the agreements that you enter into with these vendors. Um, I mentioned the companies that do like the first, you know, uh, 10 bits are free and then, and then you move out for there. You want to think about this. You want to look at how their price model works and consider, I'm on the free model now, and that's a lot of fun. The next tier is not so bad. But if you go building your platform against this, what are your long-term costs? Um, how are you going to handle that within your organization when things get expensive? Um, I have a friend whose entire consulting business is going into companies and reducing their costs when it comes to proprietary like uh, services. Um, mostly he works with Amazon. Um, because there are companies, like I worked for HP before, and I can't tell you how much we're spending on Amazon, but there were like seven figures in it. Like, it was like millions of dollars, and this is not uncommon. Companies spend lots and lots of money on their cloud technologies. Um, so you want to know, understand how you're going to handle those long-term costs and have a plan in place. And maybe you do bring in a contractor when things get really expensive, but know that that is, that is actually a real risk. Um, now, I said lots of scary things. And you could just go ahead and consider all these things and acknowledge them as acceptable risks. Um, lots of companies do. I mean, the cloud is a big thing. Platforms as a service, software as a service, all of this is super popular. The company I work for uses tons of software as a service. Like, all of our HR systems, all kinds of things that we work with are just um, things that we bought. Um, and that's fine. Um, I just implore you to actually make sure that you are seriously considering these options and being aware of them when you go into this. Because it's not just about swiping your credit card and instantly having a virtual machine. Like, you need to be able to evaluate um, the platforms and really think about these things. Um, or you can look back to open source, um, which, which you get to a lot. Um, you have OpenStack, which allows you to build your own private cloud on your own hardware. So you get a lot of the benefits. There's like there are dozens of OpenStack projects that do everything from DNS as a service to databases as a service. There's a container service, all kinds of stuff, all open source that you can deploy on your own hardware, um, and that's really exciting because then you can build your own cloud in house. Um, you also have technologies like Kubernetes and Docker Swarm container management that you can install locally. Um, DCOS, which adds in a bunch of application layer stuff. So you can run your applications. Um, and all three of these that I just mentioned can be used in the cloud or on your own servers. And this is really beneficial because if you're not sure your uh, if your infrastructure may be small, you can start out in the cloud. Um, you can use a key Kubernetes or DCOS, Docker, all of that in the cloud without buying a server. And you are not being locked in to the cloud's proprietary offerings, um, but you are able to run an infrastructure that has all of the services and benefits that you need. And then when you get really big, and you no longer want to pay that giant cloud bill and decide you want to invest in the data center, you can move your infrastructures, like you can move your entire infrastructure from the cloud 
onto back onto bare metal. Um, some of these technologies also have growing support for doing sort of a hybrid model, where you put some of it on uh, bare metal and some of it in the cloud, and then have this small cloud bill for some of your applications, maybe your front-facing ones, and then your data center is handling the rest of it. Um, and that's something that's really exciting for me because you're finally being able to move your infrastructure around, not be logged in, and have the option of still not buying servers, maybe, um, but you have the option to move back to those um, if your company goes in that direction. <laughs> so that's kind of where we are. Um, I wanted to wrap up by looking a bit into the future and some of the stuff I was working on with the OpenStack infrastructure project. Um, I uh, so I have this website, OpenSourceInfo.org, and it is an entire, it's a full list, not full, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty populated. It's like uh, 20 or so open source projects that have open sourced their infrastructures. So this is like OpenStack, the OpenStack project, the entire CI system, um, using Garrett and Git um, and our uh, uh, pool of servers that we hook into a bunch of open source OpenStack files. Um, it's all open source. Anyone can replicate our infrastructure in OpenStack. Um, and that was that was pretty fun because we had sometimes bug reports where people would come along and be like, I know exactly what version of Ubuntu you're running and exactly what version of Apache is. I can replicate your whole infrastructure. And he meant it as a threat. But I was like, yeah, right? You can replicate our whole infrastructure and you can run your own open source project. Isn't that great? Won't fix. Um, and so OpenStack had a fully open source infrastructure. Um, the Oregon State University Open Source Lab, they have a bunch of hardware and most of their infrastructure is open source. So you can actually go and see their puppet configs, um, not just the modules that are shared, but actually the ones that are running in production. KDE and GNOME both have um, portions of their infrastructure that are open, stat, open source, and so do Debian and Ubuntu. Um, Debian has a whole Debian systems administrators team um, that is a bunch of volunteers who work to keep the Debian infrastructure going. Um, Ubuntu's uh, team at Canonical uh, has uh, a bunch of their Juju charms. I mean, all the Juju charms are open source, but then the actual configurations they use on a bunch of their servers are also open source. Um, they're in a big long listing in Launchpad. Um, and that's pretty great because they host, they host a few services for me as a community member and I was able to submit patches to them and say, hey, like, can you update this thing on the server? Here's the update to the Juju Char. And they're like, oh yeah, sure, no problem. And so what these projects get is um, not just the benefits from general open source, um, but they can get contributions from anyone, anywhere, um, who wants to contribute to the infrastructure. Um, and that's a really powerful thing, and it's a really good thing for me as a community member to know that as an operations person, I don't just have to submit a ticket with another operations person to get something done. I can provide them with a patch and say, if this looks good, let's go with it. And then they don't need to spend time on it. Um, it also makes them vendor independent, because they're using open source software, they're running it in an open source way on their own um, hardware, and they're building a community and, and hiring people. Um, to work on that instead of having vendors. Again, no lock-in, so they're running things totally free. And again, this is the community ownership. Like, I feel more in touch with the project um, when I can reach out to them and submit patches and understand what's going on with their infrastructure. So, um, I don't suggest that companies go out and open source their whole infrastructure, but I think we can do a better job and go a bit further than what we're doing right now. Um, because I think the value add for most of us is kind of small and that we're doing a lot of things that are very similar and so we can start sharing more of these two things. And like in the, in the case of OpenStack, we have like, we have an Elk stack running, the Elasticsearch log stack from Lana, and we have really thorough implementation and it's like a real world implementation of, of, of uh, the Elk stack which is kind of better than Elastic's documentation about it. So we're providing real service to the community by showing actual running configs and sharing those with everyone. And we did it a little weirdly because we ran into some problems that we ended up talking about. Um, so I want to leave, I think I've got a couple minutes for questions, yeah. Um, and one of the CTO of my company is also giving a uh, meetup here in July, so I want to point that out to you. 
Um, I think he's going to be talking about day two operations. So that's like stuff you need to like monitor and metrics and things you need to do after installing a system. Um, but if anyone has questions in general, comments, disagreements? So the, the question and comment was about um, having vendor lock in with AWS is one thing, but you're also now locked into the same system everyone's using, we're all using Linux. Um, so there's a couple of benefits to Linux specifically. Um, since it's open source, um, you can just hire developers to work on it. Because if all the Linux developers, companies like you know, Red Hat and SUSE and uh, Ubuntu, they all go out of business and you suddenly have no support by one working on these. Um, you still do actually have community maintained and volunteer run projects that are supporting Linux. So you've got Debian, you've got Gen2, and I think um, Arch Linux is still pretty much volunteers. Um, so you still have people maintaining it and you still can invest in it because it's open source. Um, so you don't have to worry about the company going away or the company changing things up from under you because you can go back. Yeah, so the, the comment was uh, around having maybe a mix of your infrastructure like Linux and BSD. Because if a bug hits Linux, then you're going to be in trouble and everyone's in trouble. Um, yeah, that's, that's totally a fair point. Um, and, you know, we have had pretty significant and spectacular security failures in Linux. Like, let's talk about SSL for a minute. <laughs> it's, it's, we've had some bad times, and everyone is using it, and it actually is a problem. So, if you can run a mixed infrastructure like that, you should totally do it. Yeah, I mean, even if you split things off away from open source and do invest in some proprietary things, like, if you can afford to have um, an infrastructure that's varied, it's, it's a good thing to have. And I'm glad we do have things like BSD still around that are um, you know, still being developed and worked on. So you have options. Yeah, so the question is about uh, Microsoft's total cost of ownership survey um, and how things are looking today, I guess, uh, or things stack out um, operations and developer-wise. Um, so when that was released, um, Linux systems administrators were not very common. Um, there weren't very many of us working on it, and it was pretty much only those of us who got into it because we were really like hardcore into open source. Um, today, that has changed significantly. Like, I don't actually have statistics on how many um, MCEs, the Microsoft Certified Engineers, there are today, but there were a ton of them back then. And I don't quite hear about it as much today, and I know tons of people who do Linux. In fact, I've seen an entire shift in like the job descriptions now. Like back when I started, um, if I was looking for a systems administration job, I would search for Linux systems administration, because it was default Microsoft. And now it's completely shifted. Like, now it's default Linux. If you want to have a Windows systems administration job, you now have to search for Windows systems administration because everyone just assumes it's Linux. So the talent pool has grown considerably in the Linux world, and so I'd say it's much cheaper now to get Linux people just because there are so much of us. And I wouldn't say we're, I mean, I think it's still more expensive to hire a Linux admin than a Microsoft admin, but when you think of licensing costs um, and the scariness of being locked into that platform, um, you do often have, I think it's evened out a lot. Yeah, so the question was around where I see the future of Internet of Things. 
I'm so glad you asked that question because I'm so excited. <laughs> You're not a plant. I didn't ask you to ask that question. I'm not here to talk about any of things. But I'm so excited because now is like an amazing time if you know about Linux to get into the Internet of Things. Um, there's not a lot of experience in this field, and if you know about Linux, especially if you know things about the kernel um, and about lower level programming, um, open source has really taken a huge hold here. Um, Ubuntu is being installed on robots and drones and AI things. Um, you know, you've got Alexia, but there's now um, an Internet of Things project that's fully open source, open source hardware that does voice recognition. It actually has more features um, than Amazon's product. And I'm so excited that there's like all this open source stuff happening in the internet, the internet of things space. And I see that continuing. Um, there are definitely a lot of security problems still there. Like my favorite joke right now is the S in IoT stands for security. <laughs> um, but yeah, I see, I see Linux and open source being a big player in there. Continue to be so, do so. And if you're interested in that sort of thing, I totally suggest you spend some time on your weekends and evenings and stuff because I think there are going to be jobs there. And I think people who are starting now are going to be really well suited to fill those roles. So I see a lot of people releasing you know, infrastructure, things like that, open source, but a lot of the times they're using you know, MIT or DSC licensing, and it seems like a lot of people are doing like the UCL licensing. So it's like, what is your opinion of how, how open source should we go? Yeah, so the question is, you've seen projects release things under MIT, DSC licenses rather than GPL, and how open source should we go? Um, so I, I'm sympathetic to the cause of companies who are afraid of the GPL. Um, having worked at HP, I was kind of restricted myself in what I could work on in company time. Like, we didn't want the GPL. Um, they used the word viral a lot, which I'm not super keen on. I could think it's a derogatory term for the GPL. But I understand that companies feel really scared about using GPL software. And I think MIT licenses, Apache license, and PSD license, I think they're free enough. Um, and in fact, that's what I have to do these days, just because having worked for a big company, I now understand the challenges and concerns that they have. Even though they're not entirely realistic, I think, all the time, um, I'm sympathetic to that now. So everything I release is pretty much a patchy license. All right, thank you, everybody.